Well, I'm now joined by Eric Salama, who's the Chairman and Chief Executive of Cantor. Eric, thanks very much indeed Pleasure. for joining us. It's quite interesting when you look at the uh, ranking results for 2018. You know, we've, in 2018, we see the highest percentage increase of the brand value that we've ever seen. Uh, we've seen every single sector increase in value, which is uh, uh, strange. Nice, but uh, we don't see that every year. Does this mean that the world's economy is back in full tilt and uh, we're well past the recession, which seems to have lasted forever? Well, I think companies are sitting on a ton of cash um, so they can spend it in lots of different ways. And we are seeing companies thinking more and more about how to grow their top line and how to increase their prices. So I think to some extent, there's a lot of confidence in the business sector around the world, and we've seen that really everywhere. But we do need to remember that our brand rankings and our brand valuations are partly dependent on what happens to the stock market and to the financial side of it, and that has boomed everywhere. But it partly depends also on the relationship between the brand and the customer. And I think there we've seen a much more varied picture with some of the brands not building a stronger relationship and some brands doing exceptionally well in terms of building that. I mean, from what you said, I mean, you, you spend quite a lot of time talking to uh, global CMOs, global, global CEOs. Um, do you see them looking at what they're currently doing and saying, actually, the balance is slightly off tilt now and we need to sort of put our foot more on the accelerator of growing the brand and demand generating as opposed to managing costs, which seems to have been uh, what people have been doing over the last few years. I think they're still going through both. Certainly in the packaged goods area, we still have a lot of our clients who are looking at their costs and cutting. And um, I think it's always worth remembering that kind of lesson that we've learned from Brand Z and we've proved time and time again through other studies which is that companies who invest in their brands do grow faster and grow shareholder value faster. Um, but I think we are seeing a lot of questioning from clients as to how to spend that money, what's the best way of generating demand. So I think they all want to generate more demand. Some of them have got the kind of plan nailed and they're doing it, and some of them are still figuring out what it is that they need to do to generate that kind of demand. Now, for a long time, We've been talking, and in fact, WPP have been investing in China for years, um, around a sort of a, a continuous growth. Uh, there are a lot of skeptics about two to three years ago saying that China was sort of just about to fall off the edge of a cliff and a lot of doom and despondency. We certainly haven't seen that. China hasn't seen that. And yet, and actually, we've seen this year, um, when we first started doing the rankings, there was one Chinese brand. There are 14 Chinese brands. JD.com um, is the fastest growing uh, brand in the rankings this year. What's going on in China? Is this, is this a market that really is just about to, to accelerate again? So I do think we're seeing an incredibly assertive, self-confident China. And the thing that people who haven't been to China when they go can't believe is that China is not an emerging market. It's not a developing market. It's the most sophisticated e-commerce market in the world bar none. So the, the idea that this is this kind of big country catching up with the US or Europe, it's just that that may have been the case ages ago. It's certainly not the case now. And do you think that model, if it is indeed a model, of uh, large countries becoming much more self-confident in themselves and in their brands is something that we see or will see across um, other countries and, yeah. and you know, giving a, a run for the money for the, uh, for the uh, multinationals as well. I think we're seeing it everywhere. I think we're seeing it in India, where local brands are growing faster than multinational brands. We're seeing it in Indonesia, we're seeing it in Colombia, we're seeing it in Brazil. Um, and I think what we're then seeing as a result of that is a lot of the multinational companies saying to themselves explicitly, we need to be much more country focused. We can't just take our global methods and roll them out. We need to give more autonomy to individual countries within a framework. So I think we are beginning to see much more of a battle at a local level. And if you talk to most of the multinationals in most sectors, their competition is not the other multinationals, it's the local players who are closer to the customer often, more agile, faster, they're sometimes family-owned, so easier to make decisions. 
Um, and I think that's where the real battleground is. When we spoke uh, last year around the um, launch of uh, the 2017 rankings, uh, your Kantar first strategy was in its infancy. Um, it's been uh, uh, rolled out for more than a year now. Um, what difference is that making both uh, internally but probably much more importantly to our clients? Uh, well, we're seeing um, clients at schools zoom up. Most importantly, we're getting the best of Kantar to our clients. So more often than not now, we're actually getting the best capabilities, the best thinking, the best combination of offers to our clients, regardless of what brand they're working for within Kantar. So I think clients have really responded well to that. It's a very difficult environment that we're working in, but we're growing share, um, we're growing customer satisfaction, um, and we have our clients quite openly saying, you're delivering to us in a way that you didn't 18 months ago, which is fantastic. I think the other thing which is beginning to happen is that for our people, they're getting more opportunities to really learn. There's a lot more sharing that's going on internally. People aren't keeping good stuff to themselves and worrying about sharing it in every aspect of our business, in marketing, in finance, in HR, um, in how you grow a business, in business development, in how you do events. I mean, really in every part of what we do, there's a real spirit of sharing the best and people learning from that. So we've still got a long way to go. I don't want to suggest that we're all done and dusted, but we're in a completely different place internally and externally than we were a couple of years ago. Now, I think many people think there's an elephant in the room which we haven't talked about, um, which is some of the press comments about what may or may not happen to, uh, to Kantar um, in a slightly different WPP world. Yeah. Um, what's your perspective? Well, Mark and Andrew have said that um, WPP is doing a strategic review and that um, you know, I have every confidence that they'll do a review which is in the best interest of WPP and all of its stakeholders. Um, I'm very confident in the future of Kantar. I think we have a great business. We do great work. We have great impact on clients. Um, so I'm, you know, whatever happens, happens. But I think um, the people in Kantar will be fine and Kantar will be fine as a business. I hope that it's within WPP going forward. So it's been a pretty strange uh, year, Eric, hasn't it? It has, it has. And as an Arsenal supporter, Arsene Wenger leaving Arsenal has been a big shock to all of us. Well, uh, that's after 22 years. Martin leaves WPP after, what, 35, 36 years. Do you think we'll get a, you know, a triple and uh, the Queen might abdicate <laughs> in 2018? Oh, please no. <laughs> well, Eric Salama, uh, always a pleasure. Thank you very much, Dee, for joining us. Thank you very much.